All right, everybody, welcome to the Utah Valley University Digital Audio Lecture Series on the audio profession. It's the audio industry. And so in this series, you guys are going to be exposed to various levels of professionals in different stages of their careers, from those who have retired and those who are just starting their career to those who have found great success in their career. And the whole entire idea of this lecture series is to expose you guys to top talent who have had to go through the same steps that you guys are about to experience as you guys prepare yourself for graduation. We have uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors in this class. Um, and so they're at various levels. Some of them have interned in different capacities at different places. And some of them have graduated in other degrees and come back to get degrees in uh, audio engineering so that they can further themselves in education to progress in their future. So today we are very fortunate to have Jackie, Jackie Boom, Jacqueline Sanchez here with us. Say hi, Jackie. Um, Hello. <laughs> Jackie, um, you, I'm just going to like go through and ask a couple questions and then we're going to turn the time over to the students here to ask questions as well. Uh, everybody in the class has seen your bio, but because this is be being recorded and will be shared online as well, some people don't know who you are and what you do for a living. So would you please give us a brief overview of what it is that you actually do? All right. Um, well, my name is Jacqueline Sanchez. I was coined Jackie Boom by Steve Jordan. He's a very prolific drummer and producer in the world. And it kind of just stuck. Um, I'm a recording engineer, mix engineer. I've, I've done basically anything when it comes to audio, I kind of just say yes. So I've done touring, I've done front of house, I've done monitors, I've done playback. Um, I helped build a studio in Brooklyn called Electric Garden. Um, I've been doing this for over 10 years. I've gotten to work with some of the top, top musicians and artists um, throughout my career. Some childhood dreams definitely have come true. Uh, I won my first Grammy in 2021 for the album John Batiste, and I was also nominated with her in the same year for album of the year. And those were all unexpected successes. And even with success, you know, I'm a freelancer at the end of the day. I'm my own boss and I love it. Um, but that comes with ups and downs, no matter how high you go or how low it gets. So, but every day I get to do what I love. I'm very, very fortunate and grateful that I get to be around top tier talent and music musicians every day, basically. So that's a little bit of me nice. in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, just just the quick, really quick path um, to yeah, and the highlights, you know, yeah, highlight reel. Yeah. It's it's fantastic. Um, you said that you love what you do. For some people, getting into this career path, it becomes a labor of love, and then they quickly get disenfranchised with things that go on in the audio industry. How did you? Number one, how do you like? What do you love most about it, and how do you keep that that romance going when uh, when things get tough? Um, first and foremost, I'm a musician, right? I I sing in choir since I was a kid, put on little shows. I I'm, I'm a musician first. I don't know how long I would have lasted if I didn't have the opportunity to work with really great musicians through from the beginning to to now in my career. Um, Cause I do hear, you know, there are some engineering gigs that get very boring, or maybe are you working with people that are not as talented, but they're paying the bills. So I got to say the music, my remembering my love, my first love is music. So my love for music is what keeps me going, being re-inspired by music. Um, and sometimes when you're a musician first, you kind of prioritize music over everything, over family, over relationships, over money. <laughs> um, and that's what really keeps me going. I do tell people if stability is what you're looking for, this may not be the best job, 
But when you do establish some stability, it does seem to pay off in the end, but it, it does take a lot of sacrifice and time. And there's also so many different paths that sometimes you just got to get creative with it. But my love for music keeps me going. And then also my love for engineering. Like I got to admit, like I have great a great time when I do my corporate gigs and I'm doing sound for, for like very boring conferences, but I still enjoy like my, the engineering part, the audio part, um, it's, it is still something that I actually do enjoy genuinely. So that's what's kept me going is that my love for music. And also I really, really don't think I thrive in a nine to five. Cause I've, even when I've considered trying to get some stability, I end up do, like really, really hating it in the end. So I just kind of accept the lows because I realize I do enjoy being able to say no and being a little more in control of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So you uh you said that you like to be in control. You like what what typically do you do? Like give us an average day, like day in day out if you're like your routine, how do you get started with the day? What what are some of the things that help you get into the right mindset before you work with artists or before you mix? Can you talk about a little bit about your day-to-day? -day? Yeah. I it's funny. I say in control um but I'm in control of saying yes to really crazy hours and yes to really un like non-orthodox uh, routines. So as much as I'm in control, I'm also, like you said, a day-to-day -day can change. Every single day can be different. Um, so when I was full-time at the studio, sometimes I had 18 hour days where I'm starting at 9 a.m. to get the setup going. And then the session starts at noon and then we're working till three, four in the morning. And then either I'm cleaning up or getting ready for the next session the next day. So I have pulled some crazy hours. Um, and what I've learned when it comes to routine is that, you know, in a, in a perfect world, when I'm just mixing or working from home nowadays, like my mornings are mine, right? From, from like 10 a.m. to 12 or 1 p.m., I'm practicing music, I'm journaling, I'm doing yoga, I'm preparing my meals for the week, um, checking in with family. And then I don't really start working until like 1 or 3 p.m., and work till like midnight or one when I'm mixing. Um, and I kind of love that that lifestyle. But when I go into recording mode, my day changes. And so I'll condense that morning routine to where I practice space for like five minutes, do yoga for 10, quickly get ready. So I got, I've learned that if I condense my routine to like minutes, and then on days that I have time, I can spend hours, that's kind of helped me keep some sense of stability and routine in my life but it has to be flexible routines because like I said, some sessions when you're in like album mode and you're with a client or an artist, I'm pulling, like you could work straight for 30 days, right? Or if I go on tour, that's 30 days straight of touring where every day is like nonstop. You're traveling each day, you're in a different city. Um, and then and the, when I'm on tour, obviously my mixing projects are gonna be neglected. When I'm on tour, I can do revisions, but I can't really mix when I'm on the road. Um, and then, so it, it, that's what I mean by like, it changes on a day to day and what helps me stay grounded are those little routines that I establish. I used to think I, if I couldn't do an hour of yoga, then I won't do it at all. But I've learned that even if I do two minutes of it, that keeps my, my mental health stable. And another thing I do, and, and that's an example of like, I just gave you three different examples of what I do differently every day, right? Like if I'm, if I'm on a project and it's record mode, then I know for that week, I'm in record mode for that week. If I have a mixed project then I know I got to block off time and not pick up other things. I sometimes supplement my income with corporate gigs. I, I worked um, for a few different corporate companies where those are 10 hour days on average, but with overtime, which is nice. And they pay pretty well and pretty, pretty consistently. Um, and so that's kind of how I fill my month. Right. And then, and then I love, like, if I have, if I meet a certain amount of work by the month then I don't have to continue saying yes to certain things, then I can focus on some of my personal projects. So every month is different. Every week is different. Every day is different. When I was at the studio full time, still different, but a little more consistent because I was the main engineer or I was running the studio as well. So it was like, it was constantly doing different things because every artist is different. So that that's kind of, I think that answers your question. <laughs> and studio manager at the same time. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's kind of why I quit. I was like, I, I want to focus on engineering. I'm tired of hiring and training interns. I, I love interns and assistants, but it is work to train them. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of people just be like, I don't want to do another intern for a while. Cause I got to re-explain every single thing that I'm so used to doing. 
Um, which isn't to discourage any of you guys from going out and getting internships. You just got to uh, hopefully introducing you guys to the concept that even for the person who is hiring you on as an intern, they have to look at the work aspect of that as well. Um, so I, I know your path uh, a little bit from meeting you uh, in LA and getting to talk to you, Jet and Tatiana, um, but these guys aren't aware of it. So talk about your path from working. Um, well, let's go back before that. You were in choirs, then you went to Berkeley. Like, will you talk about that whole path and how you got to where you're at now? Absolutely. So just kind of give you my origin story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, I've been watching a lot of uh, Sp Spider-Man uh, catching up on the Into the Universe. So I'm in that kind of origin stories. Um, I didn't know I was going to be an engineer at all. I, w I knew I wanted to do music when I graduated high school. And so I was going to music school no matter what. I thought I could be a percussionist. Um, I played congas in high school band, but I realized very quickly that I can't play just congas. I have to know other percussion instruments to go to college for that. So I ended up just um, singing because that's the best thing I could do to get into music school. But I was going to do music business. I did study music business because I didn't know what to do. And that was the only thing my mom would like not fight me on. If as, as long as I did music business, she would support me going to music school. I had a good mentor at University of Miami who taught a arrangement class. Long story short, I, I got introduced to Pro Tools at U University of Miami and I was like determined to get to Berkeley just because Berkeley is a great, like they sell a really good dream, right? It's like very cool and whatever, but still a great, great place. I, I still work till this day with majority of the friends that I met. So everyone you look here in the Zoom, you never know, like you probably are gonna be helping each other out over the next 10, 20 years. So the people that you study with are gonna be your allies and your peers that give you opportunities. So don't underestimate your teachers, don't underestimate your peers. Cause speaking of Jet, I went to Berkeley with her. We've been friends and she's my go-to mastering engineer for the past 10 years, but I did not know Pro Tools at all. I, I remember my first engineering class. I didn't even know what a compressor and EQ was. I almost quit my course because I was the only girl in the class. And all the guys were like talking about this stuff like they knew about it. And my teacher, fortunately, was like, they don't really know what they're talking about either. You'll be fine. And I ended up being really good at it. So went through the whole Berkeley program um, in terms of the music engineering and music business. Luckily, I ended up liking it. I didn't know this was a, a talent that I had. Um, and then post graduation, first thing I notice is that when I graduate, I'm going to lose access to studios, right? Once you graduate your, your college, you no longer have access to these, this cool equipment that's very expensive. So I interned at a nonprofit recording studio in Boston called The Record Company. And one of the biggest things for me I've noticed straight out of college is making sure that I find internships that they let you use the equipment. Because a lot of um, places sometimes are very strict or don't really make you go through hoops to be able to get practice time. Practice time was really important to me. So luckily this studio, I could have lots of practice time. Um, then I moved to New York and I started working immediately for a producer through my friend Jet. Um, his name was Jerry Barnes. He was the bassist for Chic. And he had a tiny little room at Avatar Studios, which is now Power Station in New York City. But again, I got a lot of hands-on training wheels, kind of like unlearning what I need to unlearn from school to get a little more practical advice. Um, so a lot of overdubbing, editing drums, um, tuning vocals. So these were skills that like I, I kind of had from college, but working with this producer, I had to really like at home, I was studying at home, I was like the learning never stops. I think the biggest thing you'll gain from your college education as an engineer is that you got the foundation and how to learn things quickly. Because like I've said yes to gigs, not knowing the console, but I've, I know the basics of a console so that I could say yes and quickly learn a console if I need to. So that's going to be your biggest asset getting out of college. Um, and then internships, I worked, I also interned at Electric Lady, which didn't give me a lot of access to equipment, but I did take advantage of their tech guy that taught me, he even hired me to help decommission an SSL console. So you just got to always kind of get creative outside of college. Something that I learned is like weighing the benefits of certain opportunities based on your goals, right? Um, so my first gig in New York did pay me $10 an hour, which was very fortunate that I found a job in my field that would pay me something. 
But I also, over time, I stuck it out because I'd get access to their room while they were on tour and they trusted me enough. So like that was kind of my, the way I've kind of played the game most of my career is like getting access and staying in, to, in touch with my peers and working on their projects whenever I could. So offering to record them for free, offering to mix my friend's records when I was trying to get my chops up while still getting this hands-on experience while working full time. So like very, very crazy schedule, I realized when I look back. But, um, and I just kind of stuck it out, you know, through Jerry, I met my other mentor, Ben Kane, and would assist him said yes to a, a free gig, um, where I didn't get paid, but at least he bought me dinner. And I was there working full time 8am to 3pm teaching kids uh, after school program, summer camp program, then going to the studio till 4pm and then staying up to 4am and then repeating that for a week straight because we were finishing an album that he was mixing. Um, so knowing to say yes, knowing to, to put in hard work and, and then just also balancing what your goals really are, right? Like if, if like, and, and sometimes knowing the worth of what learning from someone is access to, to resources and then payment, right? Like those are like the three things that I would juggle of like, okay, is this really helping me in this direction? And then knowing when to leave. I knew after three months at Electric Lady that I wasn't going to grow there. They were not going to let me use the studio. I was already working. And so I realized I don't need to try to fit into this group because I don't think I was going to get the opportunity there. So I left. I still get to put it on my resume. I still got some cool experiences, but I knew I wasn't going to grow there. Whereas like with Ben, I stuck it out for 10 years. I've worked with my mentor, Ben, who's the owner for Electric Garden for over nine years, on and off, right? I, I When you work with someone, you stick it out, but when don't don't underestimate like keeping your eggs in different baskets. You know, you sometimes you have to do that to survive. Um, but then also Ben, I probably hadn't heard from Ben in six months. And I remember texting him just to say, hey, and that brought me back into his like memory. And he hired me for another assistant gig, you know, so don't don't ever take it personal too when people don't call you. Sometimes they just forget. And if they see you or get a text from you, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that guy or that girl. And they'll and they'll hire you again. So you'd be surprised how much that goes if you if you know you did a good job on the last gig. Um, so that's like the snippet of how, I think that says a lot, right? Did I answer the question? I yeah, hope I did. Definitely did. <laughs> um, and I, I like how you have been just candid about like certain times you think that the dream gig isn't the one that actually gets you where you're wanting to go. Um, a lot of people might look at Electric Lady as like the, you know, their, their golden egg. Uh, mm -hmm. their key to success. And for you, you're like, this isn't where I'm wanting to go. So when you're, when you're uh, making the choices that you're making through this process and, and you're discovering like who you are as an engineer, as a, as a, as a musician and all these things, who are some of the influences that guided you in like, what you wanted to do with this, like favorite artists or favorite producers or like things that really helped you kind of discover your own path through that discovery. So you mean like, what are some artists that inspired my path artists or, or engineers that you looked up to or, you know, engineers? Some, yeah. Just, just whatever helped you um, carve your own, own path through this. Yeah. I mean, I think because I went to Berkeley, I had a lot of peers that were in the jazz world, right? Jazz and instrumental and fusion and hip hop and R&B and, and just like incredible prodigious musicians are my friends, which was like a perk from, from going to music school, I feel that I gained. Um, and so through that, you know, I was recording them from college. So I had one project from college with, that had like Casey Benjamin, um, I don't know if you know these people, but these were all like at the time with Robert Glasper crew and and like my friend somehow convinced them to be on this college album pro project that we recorded. And so fast forward to New York and choosing these artists, it's like I, I somehow started to attract. Um, so I, this is where I, I do use my women intuition. Um, and I think all men, all genders have intuition. I just think I, I it's hard to explain logically how I know when to say yes to something, because sometimes it's a gut feeling. Um, and so trust that and cultivate that even within yourself while being practical and putting yourself out there, right? Like I did, I kind of do both. 
But my first gig, the bass player for Chic, and I kind of look at it, it's like a little full circle. My mom grew up on disco. I grew up listening to Chic, and then I ended up working with the bassist that plays for them. Like, and as soon as I saw that post, I just knew it was it was going to be my gig. I just knew. Like, I, I didn't even have a question about it. I just, like, took the leap, moved my – he was like, I can't interview until you move. So I was like, fine, I'm moving. Just had to say, you know, I had, I was a, I prepared myself for this moment where I was like, okay, I'm ready to move now, even without a job. But I knew I got the job before it was official in my gut. And through that, it's like fast forward to Ben. It's like Ben's mentor was Russell Elevados, who I look up to. And I grew up listening to Alicia Keys and D'Angelo, like all these records that I grew up listening to. I later realized Russell Elevado mixed, you know, um, so Everything I listen to has come full circle from Common to Miss Lauren Hill. I say Miss Lauren Hill because that's what she makes us makes us call her moving forward. Um, but it was a dream come true. Like the inner child in me was like, oh my God, I grew up listening to Lauren Hill. I grew up listening to Common. Um, I used to love her as, as, as one of Common's songs that most people don't know and that changed my life. And so uh, how can I explain what you're listening to? You'd be so I do think you you attract it if you put yourself in the right circles, if you go after the the people you like, like uh, and then then as I got more aware of what my career really was going to be um, like an electric lady, I feel like I gained a lot from even being close proximity to Tom Elmhurst. I love a lot of Tom Elmhurst's work. Um, Manny Moroquin is another engineer that I really like look up to and like their sound. Um, but I've also learned through Ben because with Ben, Ben Kane is my mentor. He was kind of um, shadowed Russell Lovato most of his career. Um, a lot of that was analog mixing. So a lot of times I was in the back room just sitting there. Like it's not like sometimes the teaching doesn't come from literally teaching you. Sometimes the learning comes from being in the room and listening. Right. So I realized all those hours I spent sitting in the back of the room, hearing the mix evolve. Um, in the moment, sometimes I thought I wasn't doing anything or learning anything, but now that I I'm, I'm 10 years in and I'm now mixing more, I look back and I'm like, that was training my ear. That was training my, my psyche. And I guess, what was I going with this with artists that inspire me and everything, Ben? Um, I guess to, 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 I don't know. I kind of got lost with this question, but that's a point lot of is, so. yeah, but I think point is, is that it's a little bit of where I think you attract what you like, right? Like, like if you like heavy metal and you know the artists in that genre, then you're going to know who makes those records. And, and sometimes you'll be surprised how what you like kind of starts to come to you in, in its own way. The other part is once I did have more of a definition of where I see where I'm, I'm thriving, right? Like I'm thriving in jazz world. I'm thriving with live instrumentation. I'm thriving with hip hop, jazz, indie, some some Latin music too. I worked with a jazz Cuban artist, um, you know? So like all of the things that I grew up listening to came to me in my career because that's what I'm attracted to. That's what that's where I thrive and I understand the music. So your background and what you're listening to is really, really important. And then now I know where, I, where to pursue. I go to shows, I go, I try to meet people that are making their projects. Um, I follow people that I, I like their music. If I don't like their music, I'm not gonna be able to mix it well. You know, and I always tell people, I rather recommend someone else who I think will do better than mix something that I don't like, right? That um, and that's, that earlier, and that's right? like, with your, go with, ahead. With your colleagues and your yes. classmates, like uh, you said that, it, it, it's something that I totally agree with because a lot of the people that I graduated with, we will pass projects along like, dude, this is totally your, your ballpark. This is not for me. And, and the, exactly. those are the people that you turn to, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so it's funny, I moved to LA to get kind of get a little bit out of a pigeonhole where I think I was getting stuck just with jazz musicians. And so this is an example. You're literally in the middle of I'm successful, but I'm actually pivoting and trying to get out of being pigeonholed. Right. So, um, yeah, good point to point out. It's like it's all related from what you listen to, to your peers, to places you put yourself in um, and then also knowing what you want. Right. Like knowing what is it that you really want? Like I'm very clear now that I want to primarily mix and I want to mix in a wider genre span than what I've been kind of put in naturally. Right. And so 
let's talk about that for a minute. You you've got to work with some really big names and you, like you said, you're pivoting now. Does it feel like you have to start over and what are some of the like hard knocks lessons that you have to get going through this type of transition where you've gone from the East coast. Now you're out in LA. You know, this is a great question that most people don't answer. I think, honestly, um, it's not, I do have to keep the mindset that I'm not a hundred percent starting over, but I do need to be humble enough to know that it is starting over. Right. I'm in a new city where I have to learn the culture here. I have to learn the studio culture here, the, the creative process culture here. It's different in every city, whether you're in Nashville, whether you're in Miami, whether you're in Atlanta, New York, these are all major cities. Even if if I have some engineer friends that chose to, to settle in like Ohio and they're in they're engineering still, but it's a different culture there. Um, so some of the pitfalls is like, I did just do a really great session that I think was a great start here in LA. I got to um, record with Robert Glasper and I was recommended through an engine, his engineer, and I got paid my actual rate while I'm working with another producer where the pay situation hasn't been very clear. And if you let your success and like, it's, it's knowing to read the room. And again, that value system, this producer I know is going to help me fill in the gaps for some of the genres that I want to work in that I didn't get working with with at Electric Garden for 10 years or with my mentor. This person does respect me enough where I know I'm not doing runs or intern stuff. Like they made it very clear. It's like, hey, you don't got to do that. We have our interns. But the pay situation is not necessarily as honest or available at the, at the moment. And if I would let my ego or you know, anything get in the way, I would be like, oh, I'm not coming back. And it's like, no, like right now I just moved. I'm not really busy. I can, I can go right now. I have the time to show up and I'm learning stuff that I need to learn. And I'm also maybe showing them they have never been able to work with an engineer because they're very particular. And they're, and this producer was one of the first people that made me nervous on a session when I hadn't been nervous at Electric Garden for years. Like I was already like every session, I was never nervous. Even on some of the famous ones, I no longer was nervous. But when this producer asked, hey, can I jump on Pro Tools? And he started doing some stuff I've never seen a producer do in Pro Tools. I was like, I need to learn by this guy. And here I am two years later now going more consistently to their home studio. He has been showing me some things I haven't learned yet. Um, so that's an example of like, here I am pivoting and you got to know when to say yes and when to say no. My no's are a little bit more now because I do have experience. There are certain things I won't do. Um but I'm not afraid to still go get coffee. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, even with a Grammy, it's like, I've learned that humility takes you a long way, but it's a dance and you got to trust your gut. Now, the moment I start to feel taken advantage by this producer, guess what? I'm going to be unavailable. But I, I, you got to play, you know, uh, that's, I guess that's the answer. It's like, read the room, trust your intuition, but don't let your ego or what you think you deserve um, stop you from maybe cultivating a relationship that could be beneficial in the long term. Because sometimes I find that that gets in the way um, for a lot of people because one day you'll make 100K, the next year you're making 10, 20K again. So this is this industry is very vol volatile. So if you don't keep that in mind, your ego may hinder some of your opportunities if you're not careful. No, yeah. oh, I, I really appreciate the, again, the, the honesty and the answer there. Mm -hmm. because a lot of people think, oh, well, you've got a Grammy, so you're making millions, right? <laughs> and and it's funny that we have some false perceptions and they're perpetrated that way. They're like, oh, well, everybody that's got a Grammy is successful. Well, everybody that has a platinum album on their wall is 100% successful and always has people knocking down their doors when in reality, you're out there still hustling, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the point that I want to draw to on that is that you're out there still saying, I don't know it all. I'm still mm -hmm. learning. So this, this has been a lifelong educational journey. I'm, I'm not the top dog anywhere. I, I have the top dog in my own skin, but I still need to be able to pick up on things that, uh, that are valuable from the people around me with all of that in mind. And as you've moved out, look at the next 10, 15 years, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself still in LA? Do you see yourself going somewhere else? 
where where is Jackie Boom gonna be in 10, 15 years? Um 10, 15 years. I'm not sure where long term is yet. Um I, I definitely want to give Callie a chance. Um, but in terms of my goals in my careers, I mean, I'm definitely considering opening my own studio in the next 10 years, um, probably more in the next five. Another thing I see is I definitely hope to make some more top records, like top, like that top hundred type of thing. I really, for me personally, most of the top mix engineers, I will say this as a woman, most w successful women engineers kind of get stuck at recording in terms of their success. And even my Grammy, even though it says mixer engineer, I was a recording engineer. That's why I got credited. Um, but I do think it's foreshadowing that I do want to be up there considered with Manny Moroquin, the Tony Maseratis. That's my goal. Hence why I'm here in L.A. Um so I, that in the next 10 years, I will be doing a mix with the masters and hopefully some of you will recommend your students to come to it in, in Paris. Um, and just uh, really just keep making great music. You know, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I'm kind of already living my dream. I, I work on great music all the time. So, you know, I have those long-term goals. I want to change some legislation to help touring musicians be able to have legal virtual therapy in all 50 states, because right now the way the laws are set up, when I went on tour and I needed to see my therapist, I couldn't. So these are all my goals that you'll see see in the next 10 years I will accomplish. And so. That's awesome. Do you yeah. have a board at all? Like uh, this, we're getting into a little bit of, you know. As a the woo-woo, the juju yeah. stuff. Yeah. I'm all about the juju stuff. I'm telling you, I, I sage studios. I bring Palo Santos on my sessions. Um, and you'd be surprised. All you got to remember artists, create music, creativity. Most of this stuff is, is very personal and very emotional. So don't underestimate the psychology. That's one thing I would do want to point out. Yeah. Going to therapy is going to make you a better engineer. I promise. <laughs> Cause I, I, a lot. I, yeah. I've told huh? my students that a lot of time producing is being a therapist, right? Basically. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, what, um, do you have any, any uh, studio horror stories about people breaking down and you having to bring them, reel them back in for a uh, I'll tell you the story of me breaking down in a studio. My first gig with Jerry, he was working with this Middle Eastern artist who survived a lot of traumatic things. And the topic, uh, trigger warning, the topic of molestation came up. And I'm a woman and I've been through that. And, and I just remember breaking down. And it was just like this healing moment that the producer like took time to talk about. And it was like, it's okay. Like some of those raw moments is why now this is a long life friend. Um, but that's something, that, for example, if your artist is singing about a topic or a musician is singing a topic that's sensitive, they might have a breakdown just like I did, um, that they can't contain because we're, we're healing and we're talking about these things. So that's a, not a horror story, but I was scared. Like that's scary sometimes to, to break down while you're working. Um, but then it's a sensitive topic. Like it's, it's normal and human. Um, I'm trying to think of like worse horror stories of other people. Um, and so, yeah, actually yeah, not, 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 nobody's really broken down. We just end up having really deep conversations and tears happen, but nothing where it's like, oh no, mental breakdown. Like, no, if anything, it's always been, the studio has always been a very healing, safe space. Right. I think. I, and that's what I try to prom promote with our, with our students is that the studio needs to just be a safe place where like any, any egos or anything we bring into the studio just needs to be dropped at the doors because we're all learning. When we get yes. into that console, there's not every single person knows every single thing about everything. And that's one of the great things that I've loved about listening from you through this is it's like, if I was to pull out a couple of like highlights, it's your learning lifetime learning. Yep. Constantly setting and resetting goals. Yep. And you're allowing yourself to be surrounded by people who can help elevate you to where you want to get. And I, I think that if I was like to pull out three highlights out of what we've talked about so far, I think that's what they would be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, and also remember, it's like I've attracted a very deep like people that are into this type of stuff. Right. There are artists I've worked with that are party people. You know what I mean? And the in the studio is a party for them. Like you, you kind of got to know where you thrive and where you don't thrive. I know that I don't do well in some of those party environments. So I, I choose not to try to work in those situations. But if you're cool with that, just know it's a, an eclectic. There's lots of music in the world. There's lots of things in the world. So yep, just a heads up. 
Okay. So before we jump over to the Q and a with the students, um, I want to ask you the final question is what advice could you give to our students, uh, that are trying to make it like, what's, what's one thing that you maybe wish you would have known getting through school? Well, um, one thing I wish I would have known really, I mean, I think one of the biggest ones for me personally has been how to talk about money. I think I took a lot, a very long, how to, how to talk about money and then also how to ask for something. You know what I mean? Like I used to be very afraid to ask for practice time. Um, sometimes like, uh, I would wait longer than most people. Um, but I think that has to do with my background um, and my relationship to money. But I, I feel like the last couple of years, I've gotten a lot of a lot more support in how to talk about rates, how to how to negotiate, when to negotiate. So my biggest advice is like it learn to talk about money sooner than later, because I feel like in school you focus on your skills, you focus on your tech and that's forever you're going to be learning like lifelong learning, but then also address any of your issues with money. If you're not uncomfortable talking about money, um, that's something you want to start practicing sooner than later. Awesome. No, I, I think that's awesome. Cause some, there are a lot of gigs people get into and they're like, yeah, this is my rate. And they're like, oh, well we didn't have that budgeted for you. And you're like, oh yeah, I should have talked about that way ahead of time. So again, yeah, so addressing it sooner than later. And, and, and sometimes it also weeds out gigs or not gigs or just even amongst your peers. Like when I go on gigs now, I ask people their rates, which I would have never done in the beginning. <laughs> Like I'll, and then if someone doesn't want to share, I'll be like, Hey, what do you think I should be charging? You know, and, and see what they say. And I start to gauge it from there. That's how I, that's how I set my rates is I asked somebody like, what, yeah. how did, how did you come up with your rate? And they explained it to me. So that that's really great advice. Cause I wouldn't have even thought to share that with my own students, but so thank it's you cause you're, we're focused on the tech. And I, and I think we underestimate how much the financial aspect and the psychological aspect is involved in your career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Let me uh, switch this over to the gallery view. Where we can see everybody. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have questions. So feel free. Uh, I guess we'll raise hands, right? I think there's a hand raise emoji in the reactions at the bottom. Uh, you guys can raise your hand. Go ahead, awesome. Ethan. You want to have a question? Yes. Uh, I was just I was just wondering. So when you're moving to um... I guess my my question for you is like, what is your advice to like, say, moving to somewhere like New York or L.A.? What do you try to do to get your foot in the doorway to certain studios? How much do you rely on networking or what skills or I guess per se, um, what would you advise for good networking skills or I guess any way of trying to get into the doorway without being overly sycophantic? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I recommend you got to you got to network in what's authentic to you right so if you're a social butterfly and you're charismatic great if you're an introvert then then networking is probably a little tough right um and so what i find um is don't underestimate like be yourself right cuz we can feel people feel when you're not authentic um i i mean networking is really about building relationships and friendships and Sometimes when you're forcing things, it doesn't, it's it's uncomfortable for everyone involved, even the person that maybe wants to give you an opportunity, but they're a little overwhelmed. Um, and then it's it's again, if like you really see yourself in a position, like do some homework, do do some research on the people you're networking with, on the on the places you are. Uh and there are, it, it's okay to to do some cold emailing for some studios. Like I know electric ladies constantly hiring interns. Like you could go to these major cities. Just remember major cities are going to be very competitive. Um, and so one, I'll tell the story of my, one of my assistants that I hired in New York. Um, I was already done. I had already picked two people. I wasn't going to look at any or more resumes, but they emailed me what their resume and the cover letter. And they shared their story about being a trans uh, trans person. And just the way they told me the story made me one. I, I I'm an I'm an ally. And I and I decided, you know what? A lot of trans people don't get jobs often in certain cities or certain places. And their story moved me and I decided to give them a chance. And they were amazing when like they were the best assistant I've had and if I wouldn't if they if they wouldn't he wouldn't have taken a risk and shared their story with me then you know I would I would have never I would have lost out on a great assistant because till this day he's an incredible assistant engineer and an assistant personal assistant but then I had another person that was super eager but like didn't listen to 
to instructions, like was like, I told them I would reach out to them, follow instructions. That's another big one. It's like, I told this person I would follow instructions. They called me two days later to like check in on the position. And, I, and that was an example of over eagerness where I was like, Hey, I told you yes already. I told you I will contact you when I'm ready. And now you're over Like, this is not, this is too much, you know? And in the end it didn't work out. So being yourself and finding that dance, because sometimes you need to be like this producer that I still want to work for. I've been the one that's been persistent, right? Shot them a DM. Hey, I'd love to assist for you. This was like before the Grammy, after I'm, I'm engineering the session, I, I sent him a DM like, Hey, I would love to learn from you. Let me know if there's any times I can come just assist or shadow you never really happened. Then I ran into him at the Grammy. So that made him respect me a little more, obviously. So we, we exchanged contact. That was two years ago, almost hired me in New York, never did. And then here I am in LA, like I've been going more consistently to their home. So this is an example where I have been persistent, but I've, it's depend, it's been shooting my shot. Hey, I'm in town. Any chance I can stop by, bring you some coffee or Hey, uh, even my gig with Robert Glasper, I, I reached out to my network of engineers that I've worked for many, many years and they've been following me. And now they trust me and recommended me for the gig, right? And and it was a simple, hey, I'm in town, would love to get lunch. We never had lunch. He's just like, hey, I got something better. Are you available these two days? You know, so my reputation helped me get the gig, but it's the humanity of, I didn't ask him for lunch for anything. I never even expected to get recommended. I just wanted to connect, you know, genuinely. So that's my advice. I hope that helps. Awesome, thank that you. That was lovely, that was <laughs> Chris, yeah. let's uh, go to you and then we'll get John's question. If anybody else has a question, you can put your hand up and we'll get to it. But um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I'm a, I'm going to do my best to not get emotional in asking you a question. I'm I'm feeling like oh, totally inspired and and I don't know how to say it, like validated um, a lot, like your experience. And like I hear, you know, I watch a lot of videos. I've watched some of the mixing with the masters and some of the uh, just like random stuff like that. And it, it, you said something earlier along the lines of like, I don't think, I don't think very many people answer this question, honestly. And I was like, every question you're answering feels so honest and so real and so vulnerable. And it, it helps. I, I'm sure that other people could reciprocate this. It like helps me um, like see that there is a path because like for me, like I'm older, if you will, in the college kind of space you know I'm, I've still got three semesters and I'm already 26 and sometimes it's like difficult to feel that you know I'm I'm married and like there's a lot of um there's a lot of producers and people in this industry that like remain not married forever so that they can do this right and and I respect that I think that's great um and it's just obviously that's not my path but um I just wanted to say thank you for being vulnerable and being real because look, I got stage right here in front of me and I got uh, incense in the studio all the time. And for you to bring up, like, just be you and be vulnerable and, and be okay with your path. Um, that was really awesome. And that's obviously not a question. So that leads me to my question though, because um, first of all, like seeing your credits and seeing like Anderson Pack and Common, I've listened to Common and Anderson Pack since, you know, like 2015 and stuff, uh, 2014, maybe even. And like, a lot of hip hop that I'm a really big fan of, but I'm also the, a fan of like a lot of electronic music and a lot of like really strange music and a lot of indie music and kind of similar to you. It's all these places, all this different stuff. Um, and that gets kind of overwhelming for me. I feel like I have to pick one. I don't feel like sometimes I feel like um, that my love for everything is actually um, a weakness. Whereas because I see people that like choose the one thing. They're like, I only love hip hop. And they just go really, really hard at that one thing. And they seem to like excel faster than I feel like I'm excelling because I have so many things that I really feel like I love doing. Maybe it's just ADHD, but <laughs> I feel like I have so many things that I love doing that I give everything a little bit less than it deserves. And how, do you like, what would you say your experience has been with that? slash like you seem to have nailed down the ability to almost do both if that makes sense be successful in a large way with a few more specific things but also do a lot of the stuff you really love so what's yeah. your advice on that for so for, that makes sense. question 
you're studying engineering, right? Um, are you a producer? Uh, like, do yeah. you make me? Do you make music? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so most of us probably do make music. Um, one of my biggest mentors, Prince Charles uh, Alexander, you should look him up. Um, he he's the one that mixed a lot of like the the original Biggie records and Mary J. Blige that that bad boy era of that time. He was the engineer behind a lot of those records. He was a teacher at Berkeley. And um, one thing he did tell me was never stop working on your creativity. And I think never stop making music, even if even if it's as a hobby, um, because it's going to one, keep your skills up. It's going to make you want to keep learning in ways that that will keep you up to date. And I think that'll satisfy your interest in all the different genres. Mm -hmm. And so I will say this, there was periods in the beginning of my career where I had only focused on engineering, right? When I first moved to New York, I barely wrote music. I barely did any of that stuff. What, and it was ironically me having like some mental health stuff where I had an aha moment. I was like, girl, you gotta keep singing. Like you can't stop making music just because you think I can't be a successful engineer. And fortunate enough, I had enough peers around me where we have to accept that we're in a new age where it is more capable of us. We have more capacity to ha wear different hats at this point in time, and we need to accept that reality. But there will be moments you have to focus because that's just how you get better and master something. Um, so I'm telling you, like, basically the answer is yes and no, right? Nice. Um, but when you you got to find your groove and you got to find, okay, I see that I'm, I'm making traction in this direction. Let me stick stick it out. You know what I mean? And then not being afraid to pivot. I, I, this is a this is a dance and this is where you, you got to put in the work. Like right now, I know I have to put my head down a little bit and like get some of my mixing chops a little bit more, keep keep focusing in that direction because I can record like without, like I don't need, I've, I've had enough focus on recording, particularly with my experience at the studio where I can get hired to record and still charge my rate and know I still know what I'm doing, right? Whereas mixing, it's like, now I'm trying to define what my process is. Like, like I've been following so many people, but now I need to know what is Jackie Boom's mixing style and my, my process and my thing, what is my thing instead of following everyone at this point, but that's 10 years of putting in this work. Um, I have continued to make my music. And now that, with that, how that's helped me in the studio is that I can, I, I'm musical and musicians and people I work with notice that I have a musician's ear and respect my musicianship at this point. But five years ago, I, I don't know if they would say the same thing. I don't know if some some of the same people that now are acknowledging my creative aspect would have even noticed it five years ago. So basically like don't stop, but just know there will be time. And to give you some more encouragement, Jet Galindo is an incredible mastering engineer. She studied psychology first. She was already in her third, like late twenties, early thirties at Berkeley. So she's older than me. Um, I transferred and didn't graduate Berkeley till 24, 25, because I, I went to two different schools. So I always felt behind as well. Um, but at, for engineers in particular, if you look at the top guys, most of those guys did not have financial success until their late thirties, early forties. So you're kind of on the right path. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I that helped me. That helped me realize most of these guys were not making the money they're making until their late thirties, early forties. Okay. So yeah, no, that's awesome. Thank you so just much. Just a reminder, like we're okay, but this is a long-term game that's going to come with sacrifice. And yes, relationships are difficult, but there are good people that if they believe in you, they'll understand, you know? Yeah. That's thank you very much. That's awesome. You're very welcome. We actually Next have Jet question. is going to be coming on um, in a couple of weeks. So you guys awesome. will to meet Jet, uh, John, Sam, and then Will. Go ahead, John. John's an excellent jazz pianist, by the way. He won't bring that up, but <laughs> you could talk to him all day about jazz piano because he's he's got the chops. Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, I actually did want to ask you about uh, mixing for jazz albums. Um, how do you ensure that each player in the group gets an adequate amount of presence and focus uh, rather than and you know, carving everyone up into smithers. Car, uh, you got cut off a little bit. Carving everyone out into wait, say that last part. Um. Oh, just like uh, you know, carving them up to the point where they all feel weak and they're all technically sharing the sound space, but you know, they all sound terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Hmm. I feel like this is one thing where I'd love to hear an example of what you think sounds terrible. But um, for jazz, how? And I guess, are you saying is this? Are you asking also when all members of the band are giving feedback on the mix? I'm just curious, or just in general. Um, that too. Uh, I guess I meant it more in general. Like, what? What's your process? Maybe you could contrast for it jazz. with like. Sure. No, because yeah. here's the thing: as a mix engineer, the guitarist is always going to want more guitar. The drummer is always going to want more drums. The bass is like, you know what I mean. And so, the most important question is: who's the artist and the producer in the project? Like, who is the main artist? Who's the one probably funding the project? Um, they're probably going to be the one that takes the final say in a lot of these options. And when it comes to mixing, it really is about intention and balance, right? You should not be carving everything up. And like that, even I'm already seeing red flags in the way you're like, oh, if you carve everyone up and it's technically in the right space, the first thing, if it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good, right? So if you're carving things up because you think it's supposed to be that way, that's already going in the wrong direction, right? The, the foundation of mixing is like, you should be able to get especially jazz and if it's recorded well um the most important thing with jazz instrumentation more traditional jazz records the recording is so important because if you don't record it well you're already at a deficit as a mix engineer and you know and that's the times when you have to know the balance sometimes i've told artists before hey we need to re-record re this or this is as best as i can get it to get you know what i mean so recording the way you're recording um once, if it's recorded well, you should be able to get a good mix with just volume and panning. That's like foundation of mixing. If you can't get something to sound decent with just getting the right levels, then you're not using your, you need to listen to more records and, and practice, like practice getting it with volume only. And once that's at a good place, don't use EQ for correctiveness. EQ is, is to enhance certain things, right? Um, so, Again, like using your ears, listening to records, like you learn techniques, but the most important thing is your taste in your ears. And so creating space is like, if it's a, if it's a, a piano artist, like Robert Glasper, obviously my focus is going to be, how are the, the piano, how's the piano really resonating? But I know Robert listens, his, his stuff is very hip hop in, influence. So I work with a lot of jazz musicians where I work with an artist who was like make jazz trill again, where our my the jazz I work on is like we're making it sound more like a hip hop record. You know what I mean? With with some traditional jazz elements. But when I mix live jazz drums, normally I'm adding a little more booty to the kick and stuff, uh, whether I'm enhancing the kick or the way I record the kick. Um, another thing that ends up happening is that a lot of people, a lot of producers will come to me because they don't know how to mix live drums. Um, in a way that makes it more modern and stuff. But if I have worked on a more traditional record, then, you know, space, um, naturalness, dynamics are going to be very important. I'm not over compressing things. Believe it or not, less is more. And with my analog background and mixing, there are some times where I don't put a plugins on certain things. I'm just putting it in the mix with volume. If it sounds good, it sounds good. I don't need to mess with it. You know, so sometimes don't overthink. If it sounds good, why are you carving it up? That's like my advice. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, yep. you. You're welcome. Sam, you're let's let's hear from you and then Will. Uh hey Jackie. Earlier you mentioned um when you're on tour that your mixing projects will kind of they'll go by the wayside. And uh is that because uh you just want to avoid the mobile setup like you won't? uh mix on a laptop with headphones or is it just you know the nature of touring can you speak a little bit about that to me it's the nature of touring for me personally right i'm sure there are other guys that they say they're mixing on the road all the time if i was the artist i would not feel comfortable with that personally but there are other people that don't care right and sometimes it's no one's business like how i'm mixing your record unless you want to be in the room then it's a different situation um but for me personally I, I know what I need to really get in the zone with mixing um, and being on the road for me when I've been on the road, I've sometimes was doing more hats than one. And I've tour managed before while doing sound. And that was just super unrealistic to think I could even get a mix done um, because just the nature of touring. But again, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? Like if it's a really big opportunity, you have to weigh out which one is more important. Do I 
Do I book time on my day off at a studio while I'm on tour? Do I tell, do I take the mix gig that's bigger until my, cause sometimes for, for me, touring is an, uh, is like a job, like corporate sound touring is just making some money when I'm on slow seasons. Right. Whereas like some in mixing projects are going to be more important where I might say, Hey, I can't do the rest of this tour. If Beyonce decided to hire me for mixing, you feel me? Like I'm just using that as an exaggeration, but that's kind of the reality for me. But if you could do it, more, more power to you, you know? And if you're and your clients are happy, then then mix on a laptop. I've learned now to, I now am completely portable with my mixes, even though I came up with an analog mindset. Like if in a perfect, my, my mentor only mixes analog, which is not practical anymore in the, in the environment that the industry's in. But he has his clients. I'm a hybrid. I kind of, I can do analog mixes, but I'm also mixing remotely as well when I need to. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I will. Hi, Jackie. Uh, Hi. I'm, I'm Will. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet um, you. My question's sort of two-parted. So it starts with um, just when you mentioned getting to be, you know, that top 100 uh, mix level engineer, right? Uh, so I kind of wanted to ask how what are the steps you're taking pivoting from recording into mixing and how they relate and sort of what you're doing there. And then the second part of the question is about how you mentioned wearing multiple hats. When you, when do you know which hat you want to wear for a project, whether you want to be the recordist or the engineer, the mix engineer, whether or not you're going to master it or send it out and that kind of thing. Like when do you know which hats you really want to wear for a project and when to hire somebody else? Understood. Um, so my goal as well is that I love being a part of a project from beginning to end. I do enjoy that process. Like if it's an artist I love. So I definitely sometimes, depending on the projects, the artist's budget and timeline and realistic like goals of the project, I may they may want to hire me to record and then I end up mixing it. Um, but I'm learning that that's not always necessary. And so I really have to like evaluate if the recording process is really beneficial for me to be a hundred percent part of it, or I'll encourage the artist. So it is project based really. Um, I like, if it's a purely like mainly like produced album where there's not a lot of live instrumentation being recorded, I'm not going to want to be the recording artist for the vocalist the whole time, probably, unless I'm vocal producing and I get produ production credit as well. Um, that's when I'd probably recommend someone else or an assistant to, to who can do the recording process. Because recording is a little bit more labor, I feel, physical labor and time than mixing. Mixing is very more specific. I don't like to master. I only did it back um, a couple times when people's budgets didn't allow and they were my friends. Um, but now I, I fully always tell people I don't master. I encourage them to go to Jet um, because I just, I don't, I, I can do it, but I don't enjoy it personally um and what was the other part of your question just uh switching from recording into mixing sort of the steps you take like, and how they relate. oh when I, how switching um how they relate i mean we're if you think about recording even production at this point with technology all production recording mixing and mastering we're all using the same tools we're all using an eq we're all using a DAW. we're all using a compressor we're all, you know, it's all the same tools, different intentions, right? So switching between the two, it's like, it, it is really challenging to be the mixing engineer and truly get a fresh perspective as a mastering engineer. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that's like, I'm not paying my mastering engineer for the tools she's using. I'm, I'm paying her for her ear and her taste. Like you're, you, the most valuable thing is your taste and your ears, your, that's what you give. doesn't matter what equipment you have, what you're using. The most important thing is that. So when I'm switching hats, um, I also make my own music. I, as much as I can record myself, I see the benefit of hiring someone to help me record my music, even though I can do it myself very well, <laughs> you know, um, because the value is that other energy, that other perspective um in all these different hats and then when I wear all hats at once it's sometimes it's great sometimes it sucks 
So it's you, you'll you'll navigate it as you get better at, at all your different skills. So I, I hope that answers your question. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Any I'm, other questions? I was going to say that if, if there's any other questions, uh, now is your time to ask them. If there's no other questions, uh, Sam's got his hand up. So we'll get you in just a second. But after Sam, uh, Jackie, if you could share like where students can follow you, um, Instagram, Facebook, wh whatever. Absolutely. Then, uh, then we can have people all know where they can go and learn more and connect with you. But uh, Sam, go ahead and ask another question. Uh, just real quick, I, I had heard in, in I read in your bio, and uh, you mentioned this earlier that um, you know you've you've got a lot of credits with working with the lower end of the sound spectrum, and I wanted to just ask you about how you approach that. How I approach the low end, right? Is that your question? Right, between like kick and bass, or you know maybe maybe those aren't the components that are in the song, but. Um, I've, the low I've heard that yeah. you have a lot of credits with that. Yeah. So, I mean, hip hop, obviously the bass and sub subs are really important nowadays, right? Like um, I've even talked to Jimmy Douglas in Miami and Flor Florida. Um, hip hop bases, like if you listen to records, 80s, the 80s, before the 80s, the low end is it. there's barely any information under 40 hertz, you know, Um Mastering your low end will make or break a song, will ma make or break a mix. And mastering that just comes with time and experience. Um, there was a time period where I would show some of my mixes to Ben and Ben would be like, yo, like when you turn it, the, when you're at a certain volume, you got to feel the low end in your chest. Like it's a physical thing, right? This is not just what you think it's supposed to be. It's how does it feel? And is it gluing and it's not overbearing, but it's still knocking. It's like, and every genre is different, right? Like if I'm mixing a country record or an indie rock record, the, the low end may be slightly different. Um, so you just gotta really, really understand like your genre and the genres you're, you're focusing on and listening to. Um, but in terms of a little more practical and technical aspect, it took me a while. Like I think a lot of young engineers sometimes misunderstand that like you gotta practice, you gotta be constantly switching from the trees to the forest, right? So like zoom in and like maybe you're carving space, right? Like you gotta decide is the kick or the bass taking the lead um, in the song because they both shouldn't be you shouldn't be trying to push them both. And you gotta be creative where sometimes certain parts of the section of the song can, it can be kick driven and then the chorus is bass driven, right? And it's subtle. Some of these things are very subtle, right? Like it's not that like it's a drastic, like all of a sudden the bass is louder, but maybe during that chorus, I'm doing some side chain compression for the bass or the kick between the two on the choruses only, or I'll, I'll automate my EQ on different sections of the of the of the songs. Um, let's say another synth comes in that has more low end information. Maybe I'm carving out a little bit of that on that section of the song in the bass, right? And sometimes I'm talking about one dB, two dB, three dB increments, you know? Because if you do more than three dB increments in your EQ, like whether it's gaining or, or subtracting, um, that to me now becomes a creative choice versus a uh, a technical choice. Do you know what I'm saying? So like I'm not saying that I don't sometimes exaggerate my cues or not, but a lot of times when I'm trying to just make space, it's subtle. Like sometimes when someone keeps telling me they they don't they want more guitar, but I know the guitar is loud enough, I I think about the EQ. Like, oh, maybe I need to brighten it up a little bit, not change the volume, but brightening it up and let, letting go some of that low end information is going to make space for it. Making sure you're using low pass filters on all, almost everything because like a vocal, like you have, there's low end information reported on the mic in every instrument for the most part. You don't need it. You know what I mean? So these are like some technical things that are like my go-tos, but it really is listening, listening, listening. I'm constantly listening to music. I'm constantly analyzing, but learning how to like zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. So like I might do something crazy, but then I'll zoom out, see, hear it in context, soloed, it sounds kind of crappy, but in context, it sounds great. Or I'll, I, I'm also a big advocate where I exaggerate. So like, I like to hear things exaggerated and then I back off. You know what I mean? So like sometimes a certain instrument with low end, I'll like do a low, um, I always mess up the terms when I'm letting the low end pass. Like right now I'm, I'm having like, my brain is like, oh no, am I saying the wrong thing? When I'm cutting out the low end, <laughs> um, 
I'll go all the way where it sounds weird and then slightly back off to like, I'm like, see, I don't need any of that because it sounds fine up until this frequency. But I usually go exaggerated and then back off. And, you know, so that's kind of my method for me. That's great. High Thank pass you so filter, much. Low pass filter. I always like. I knew what you meant. I know, but yeah. I always be, it's technically a high pass filter, the low end, right? I always sure. fuck that. I always mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years in the game and I still mess that up. I think so. we all do. That's yeah. really thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, we just kind of start throwing out terms. So yeah, you know, when you when you throw that low cut, uh, when you when you what? throw the and, like, wait a minute, high pass. Wait, what? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I'd be like, you know what I mean? Just take out the low end. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so how how do we find you, follow you, and so that we can keep up on your projects? What what's the best way to uh to know who Jackie is? Um, mixed by Jackie Boom on Instagram is probably your best bet um, for following me and my website, JackieBoom.com. And, and you can feel free to send me a message. If you guys want any advice, I'm always down to, to shoot me a DM or, or an email and I'm always available. I love, I love giving back or teaching because I know it helped me when I was coming up. So anybody, I would love to know, um, is anyone thinking of moving to different cities? I could, you know, you, you guys want to just tell me and like really quickly. Uh, I'm going to New York probably next year. Nice. Anybody else want to tell me? I want to go to Seattle. Awesome. Oh, I was I was going to say Seattle. <laughs> nice. Any other cities? Ethan, go ahead. Oh man, I would assume. I mean, there's there's a lot of potential options. Probably either New York, Nashville, or uh, yeah, probably Washington. Awesome. Well, let me know. Shoot me an email if you're going to New York, Nashville, or LA. Um, I do have some people, you know, I, I don't mind recommending you to Electric Garden for interns or any other studios. There's another studio called Dimension 70. That's a great studio in New York that I think is good people. Um, LA, I'm still working on my own connections, but I, I can recommend you where, wherever I can help out. And yeah, Nashville is a great city as well. Seattle has a, a cool studio too. I'm working with an artist based in Seattle and they were going to master at uh, this engineer's place. So if you email me, I can find the email and forward you the studio that's in Seattle. That looked really cool. Um, well, good luck with everybody. Good luck with your, your careers, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Well, yeah, thanks for coming in. I'm uh, Professor Sansom. For those of you who've been watching, we've been with Jackie boom or Jacqueline Sanchez and she is a mix engineer based out of Los Angeles and has a Grammy under her belt which is amazing and we really appreciate your time joining us at Utah Valley University in our digital audio department as we grow and expand our horizons we're glad that you are a part of that with us so thank you so much and we'll be in touch all right bye thank you Brian thank you everyone bye-bye thank you Thanks so much. Thank you.